Hello everyone, as was already mentioned, my name is Austin Evans, and I'm here today to talk to you about a problem that I care very about, very deeply about, and one that I find very interesting, both as a person and a scientist, and hopefully by the end of my talk with you, I can convince you that it's at least an interesting problem to think about. So as you probably noticed on my title slide, I'm talking about sustainability. And if we're gonna talk about sustainability, it's important that we first define it. As I've shown you the water cycle, this is a sustainable cycle. It's sustainable because we use this natural resource that the Earth gives us, and it replenishes it for us on a reasonable time scale. But the carbon cycle, in contrast, is not sustainable because we use carbon that's been trapped in the ground for millions of years, put it into the atmosphere, and it doesn't regenerate itself on any reasonable time scale that we could hope to recover it and use it again. Governments are taking note that this is a major problem. Uh, governments like the United States have energy initiatives to increase our usage of renewable energy where we hope to use solar or wind to substitute for these oils that we use right now. Um, the government in California is noticing the fact that their water usage is unsustainable because they use more than is simply present to them. Large corporations also take note. Dow and BASF, arguably two of the largest chemical manufacturers in the world, have entire divisions devoted entirely to sustainable synthesis. So this is a problem that a lot of people are already thinking about, and we're trying to avoid it ever becoming a big issue in chemical synthesis, which I'm gonna touch on a little bit more later, but you'll see how that is turning out. Before I tell you about that, I wanna tell you where I come at this problem as a scientist, and when George Whitesides was asked, what is it that scientists do? He replied that scientists change the way you live and die. And this is invariably true because all of our inventions, all of our discoveries, eventually are hoping to make an impact on humanity. So if we want to continue to make these impacts, we have to think about how we can keep our inventions going. And since the Industrial Revolution, chemists have found a way to go from small reactions where we can produce minor amounts of product and not a wide array of products into these massive chemical complexes where we produce gigatons of everything we need. And we produce many, many, many different kinds of products now that we couldn't have even envisioned that long ago. Just to illustrate some of those to you, I've shown a couple chemicals that we produce on massive scale. They're your medicines, your fuels, your plastics and building materials, and your electronics. So we rely very heavily on this chemical synthesis that we've established over the past 100 years. But these chemicals all have one thing in common, and that's that their building blocks, their starting materials come from petroleum. And these petroleum feedstocks are inherently unsustainable because, as I already mentioned, they don't replenish themselves on any reasonable time scale. Just imagine for a second that if the price of oil, which is correlated with the price of these feedstocks, were to double in the next 10 to 15 years, so too might the price of nearly every valuable chemical product we make. And that's a very dangerous thought because we derive so much utility from them. But this problem in sustainability isn't really new. Chemists and scientists are used to thinking about these things, and we found ways to overcome them in the past, such as at the turn of the last century when we were having problems synthesizing nitrates. Nitrates are really important because they're a major component in fertilizers, and before the turn of the century, we simply mined them, and we found out that we were running out. So this man, Dr. Fritz Haber, found a way to fix the nitrogen that's in the atmosphere into the nitrates that we can use in these fertilizers and other chemical products. So in a way, he made agriculture sustainable. And that's why this invention that he created has been credited as one of the most important of our millennia, because it's thought without it, our country would have gone without food long ago, and the entire world would have gone without food long ago. So what are we gonna do about all those other chemicals we can't synthesize renewably, that we rely on the chemical feedstocks that come from petroleum to synthesize? One option that's been considered and had limited success with things such as plastics and metals is recycling. But recycling doesn't actually solve the problem. It lets us recycle just a piece of what's in there and once we get that loss in the system, it's lost forever. So it's a Band-Aid on a problem that's growing and it may sustain us for a while, but it's not the answer. Another option that's been considered by scientists is to take the carbon dioxide and fix it into all these valuable chemicals that we rely on, just like Fritz Haber did with nitrogen. But there are two main problems with taking the carbon dioxide out of the air to make the feedstocks we need. The first is that carbon dioxide is really dilute in the atmosphere, especially when considered next to things like nitrogen or oxygen. So it's difficult to accumulate large enough quantities of it to really generate the industrial feedstocks we need. 
But perhaps the more important problem, and one that you're a bit more familiar with, is the fact that it's really energy intensive to go from carbon dioxide back to those feedstocks. But we're used to it from the other way, where we use those feedstocks to produce energy to move our cars or heat if you ever stand near a fire. Just think, to go from the carbon dioxide back to those feedstocks that we rely on, you would have to put this energy back into the system. And as I've already told you, our energy production isn't sustainable, so this is simply not an option. But maybe we can take advantage of some of biology's natural mechanisms to do what we can't do synthetically. So we could take plants and have them generate the chemical feedstocks that we need for us. Uh, because they actually do take the carbon dioxide out of the air and make it into valuable chemicals. But this has a problem too. Because if I asked you to build this house of Legos with square bricks, you could probably do it with relative ease. However, if I handed you Legos that looked like this, you might find it a bit more difficult. And unfortunately, that's what the plants hand us. They hand us these really complex molecules that are difficult to work with and don't really mimic the natural small building blocks that we really rely on right now. But this is a problem that can be overcome, and it's one that appeals to the best of us as scientists and chemists, engineers, where we can think creatively and come up with novel solutions to problems using the materials that the Earth gives us. It also has the large advantage that we already know how to produce these on scale, these plant products, so we could simply harvest their stocks or harvest whatever product we wanted from them and use those as our industrial feedstocks. And I'd like to draw your attention to limonene, which is in the top right of the screen, because that's what we've been working on here at the University of Tulsa. And it's a major component in orange peels, so it's a part of the plant that isn't edible, which is really important because you don't want to create competing demand for valuable chemicals that already exist, such as the food products of many plants. So we took this non-food part of the plant and used it to make these valuable plastics. And we essentially just showed proof of concept that you can actually take these chemicals that the plants give us and transform these complex building blocks into the square Legos that I was talking about earlier. So this is a really great thing, right? Because we can take what the earth gives us and it's renewable because these plants regenerate themselves seasonally. So we've shown a way to take these plant products and make the valuable chemicals that we rely on. If I could leave you with one thing, it's that we have to think really, really complexly about these problems because they're difficult. It's difficult to consider the entirety of your impact on the world and what kind of resources that you're using and how sustainable they are. But it must be done because otherwise we're going to run out of the natural resources we rely on. Also, we need people who can handle these complex problems, both as in science and policy, to deal with all these issues that are really becoming pertinent now, so that it doesn't become a serious health issue and a serious global issue in the next few decades. Also, I want you to think about science as more of a public endeavor than you might realize. Because as scientists, we pursue the ideas and the problems that are presented to us by the public. What's in the public eye is also our main goal of achieving. So if you find the problem of sustainability important, that's the first step in making a real difference. Thank you very much.